This is a 2014 Nissan Leaf, and today we're at a Leaf factory, also known as this beautiful forest. Just kidding, I'm not actually at the factory, I'm here in my yard, and the Leaf isn't a tree part, it's a car! It is not a practical car, especially for single vehicle households, but it is an car, and it was my car, and for 50,000 kilometers of driving over three years, I mostly, mostly loved it. So let's talk about the 2014 Nissan Leaf, how it's basically the gateway drug to the EV world, and why it's not a good vehicle for most people, unless your household fits some very specific circumstances. Here we go, Gen 1 Nissan Leaf, a retrospective. As I said in the introduction, the Gen 1 Nissan Leaf is basically the gateway drug to the EV world. Compared to an equivalent cost gas vehicle, it drives very nicely. The one major, huge downside is the battery degradation. But even an older, relatively good condition used Nissan Leaf with a decent battery life, you know, like 60 or 70 miles of range in the summer, can be picked up for anywhere between 5 and 10,000 US dollars. Now, you may have taken a brief dramatic pause when I said that the Nissan Leaf can only go about 60 miles. I'm taking an average here. City driving, in good weather, it can go a little bit further. Highway driving, in bad weather, it can go a lot less. Most people I talk to this vehicle seem to be skeptical about so low of a range, with stories like, I have to drive 200 miles each way, it's uphill both ways, and always seems to be minus 40 degrees Celsius, so I can't have a car with that low range. And yeah, if you're the kind of person who has a long commute, or frequently commutes to different places that are different distances, and sometimes more than the range of this car, or does not, and this is the most important one, does not have a place to charge at home, then this car is not for you and you should be looking elsewhere. The best part about a low range electric vehicle like this is that I can plug it in at home into a regular outlet every single night and wake up ready to go in the morning. During the whole world rolling over thing that happened a couple years back, we weren't allowed to leave our home zones. All I was doing was driving to and from work, about 25 kilometers each way. In the summer, I would charge every second day. In the winter, I would charge every single day. And guess what? Since we weren't allowed to drive beyond the range of this car anyways, it was perfect. I didn't spend a single dollar in gas that year. But now, at the time of recording this video, I have the opportunity to drive places, and do things, and see stuff. And this car, it's, 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 uh, again, I love this car. I have, a, I have like Stockholm Syndrome for this car. A real love-hate relationship. This car was my only car. And in the three years of owning it, I never took it outside of the Vancouver area. When I wanted to do further than 100 kilometers round trip, I would borrow a family member's car or go with a friend. I didn't have a second vehicle that could go further and that was a big pain in the butt. Even though I love the way this thing drives, I was starting to feel trapped with it within that approximately 100 kilometers zone. I also didn't want to go back to a gas vehicle because this car handles great. Instant electric torque is amazing, it doesn't smell like a headache every time I drive it, and the lack of maintenance, well, speaks for itself in its savings. I also really like the idea of energy independence where I'm not relying on oil companies or big oligarchs to provide my energy for my vehicle. I could go buy a solar panel system and power my own car, albeit very slowly, and also I'd have to own land to do that. That's its own problem, but I could theoretically go and do that right now and not be reliant on anyone else, any other countries or worldwide drama. And also here in BC, the majority of our power is hydropower, so all of the emissions this vehicle generates were front loaded into the production of the vehicle and the production of the hydroelectric dams. So yeah, you can see why this car was a gateway drug to electric vehicles. At least for my personal circumstances, there were a lot of benefits. Despite the downside of the low range, I kept using this vehicle for as long as I possibly could. Until one day, a friend comes up to me and says, I just bought a Bolt. I was like, what? Really? How far do they go? Yep, and now I no longer own a Nissan Leaf. I'm not really a car hobbyist, I'm just somebody who drives to and from work, to and from the post office, to and from events. And the Leaf was covering 98% of that until things started getting further away. Things started opening up. I moved and started having to drive more highway. Now, Nissan, 
they really dropped the ball. My car was at 130,000 kilometers and about 78% battery health when I sold it. I bought the car at 88% battery health, so in the three years it lost only 10%, not too bad, but that was substantial enough that there were times where I was actually worried about running out of juice on the way home from things, especially on those dark winter rainy days when the windshield wipers were running and the defrost was running. The car was always super optimistic on the gasometer, and it would often tell me that I had 70 or 80 kilometers left when realistically I only had about 50 to 60 in range. This was, in my opinion, one of the worst parts about the Nissan Leaf. When I sold this car, it told the person who was buying it that it had 140 kilometers of range. I very carefully and very specifically warned them that they'd probably get at best 125. But you know these car companies want to show that their car can go a hell of a lot further than it actually can. Because this range is realistic, if you're going 30 kilometers per hour in ideal weather where it's not too hot that you have to use the air conditioning, not so cold that the batteries are cold, but what, that's like three days a year. Anyways, the entire point of dedicating the last four minutes of this video to rambling about this car's flawed range is that this was my only issue with the vehicle. Seriously, if the car had been capable of going a little bit further and also had some active cooling for the battery so that it lasted longer, I would have seriously considered a battery replacement for this vehicle. But the fact of the matter is that Nissan does not support these things in North America. The only battery replacements at a reasonable cost, and you're not seeing it, but I'm doing reasonable in air quotes here, was from third parties, and there's no option for refurbishment. There's really, even in some cases, no option for direct replacement from Nissan. And that right there is the big problem with this vehicle. Nissan does not support it. If there were a battery refurbishment program or a battery replacement program that had a reasonable cost, I would have gone that route instead of buying a new vehicle. But as it stands, replacing the drive battery costs more than the car itself, and it's possible to get a drive battery from a used vehicle that is not in great shape. And the other fact is that this car was nearly a decade old when I sold it. Soon, car things are going to start going wrong with it. Wheel bearings, brakes, fluid changes, and other maintenance that's going to add expenses to a very cheap to operate vehicle. And yeah, I personally didn't want to deal with that stuff, and the cost of a new vehicle with all the climate incentives, it just kind of made sense to move on. So here's to the Gen 1 Nissan Leaf, a great electric vehicle with a great big asterisk beside that statement. For those who fit the real specific use case of having a secondary vehicle for longer trips, having a plug to charge at home so they're not charging out and about every single day, and having a short routine commute, this car is excellent. But don't go racing out to buy the first $2,000 Leaf on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. There's a high possibility that the battery on that one is already shot. Do a little bit of homework, make sure that it's one of the newer, older model years. And sometimes those 30 kilowatt hour batteries seem to degrade faster than 24 kilowatt hour. So even though this one that I had had a shorter range up front, it still degraded very slow relative to some other Leafs. And I'm going to say it again at the end of this video just for emphasis. On these cars, the battery health is more important than the mileage. Double check the battery health before buying. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope this video was helpful if you're considering a first gen Nissan Leaf. I didn't want to spend the entire video comparing it to the Bolt and all of the things that are better about the Bolt. A few of them are pretty obvious, such as the actively cooled battery and the longer range, but there is one big thing, one mentality change in how I drove the vehicle with the Gen 1 Leaf versus the Bolt. In the original Leaf, I would never speed because going slower offers better efficiency and I was always pushing the edge of my range. I drove that thing like an old person, slowly, efficiently, moving smoothly in and out of lights, and I found myself watching the battery percentage like a hawk, just to make sure that I would make it home with a little bit of charge left. At least once per week I was doing a 100km highway round trip, pushing the edge of the range of my 11 bar leaf in the winter. The Bolt on the other hand is a completely different mindset, it's so much less stressful to drive because of that extra range. I don't mind giving it a little bit extra go pedal sometimes just to get around other cars that are going slowly. And most importantly, that aforementioned 100km drive, I still do that one or two times a week. 
I recently was about 40 kilometers into that drive before I thought, oh, I should probably check what my charge percentage is at. Looked down, saw that I had 30% left and shrugged and said, well, I'm good. In the leaf, I would have been panicking. <laughs>